first of all, of course, uh, as the bookstore, we got called by the publisher saying, would you like Craig Childs to do a little flip flip into Tell Your Eye? And we were just like, yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. So we got onto that schedule and we were excited to bring him um, through the library here, um, our five-star library, keep supporting it. Um, and also to uh, Craig's host, I don't know if they're here tonight, but if they're here, thank you for hosting him um, overnight. And um, just to mention next Tuesday, right here in this room, right here in this room next Tuesday, it'll be up on the screen, live from New York, Ann Patchett, who brought us Bel Canto, is going to be speaking for one hour with J.K. Rowling, who brought us Harry Potter. It's being broadcast only to indie bookstores. We don't have the space in our store, so we're going to be doing it here. You have to be uh, on a ticket list, on an invite list. So you can sign up here or at the bookstore if you'd like to be one of the 80 people to see that one-hour conversation between two literary ladies and who knows what they'll talk about. Moving on, Craig Childs. I probably don't have to say too much if you're here. You're probably here because you're a fan of his escapades and his thoughts and, and the inspiration that comes from that kind of stuff um, of a guy that lives under a rock, as you said today on Kodo. <laughs> um, and then afterwards, we're going to be at the table there um, for him to do a signing. I don't think we have a cutoff, so we'll just keep going as long as you want to keep going. And I think um, that's it. Aside from the fact that never in my life in marketing an event have I had to type the word apocalyptic so many times. <laughs> <laughs> I really don't want to see it ever again. <laughs> and then the word ever ending, uh, it's, the title is Field Guide. To the to an end or, uh, to our ever ending or the word ever ending spell check does not like <laughs> get to the red squiggly mark every time you type it and if you know me and my type of personality that drives me nuts however you are a red squiggly kind of guy <laughs> so as booksellers and people who watch you and, and take your workshops and spread the word of a love of desert and nature so Mr. Squiggly Line. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Thanks for, for coming out tonight. Um, yes, ever ending is not a word. You know, I used to work at the Ure County Plain Dealer, um, late 80s, early 90s, so just over the hill a little bit. Yeah. And um, I tried every single issue every week to get in a word that did not exist. <laughs> and now I've gotten it on the cover of a book, Ever Ending Earth. Um, and, and I, I got it on the cover of the book because I wanted to tell this story about how ends keep happening, how, how the world is, is constantly ending, like it gets dark all of a sudden and it's just over, but then it comes back. I mean, it's, that's the thing about the world. It, it is just amazing because you can talk about the end of the world, you can talk about the coming cataclysm, but, and, and yes, cataclysms happen. To write this book, I went back through 4.5 billion years of cataclysms on Earth to say, where did they happen? What was the transition? How did it happen? What, what sped it up? What slowed it down? And how was the recovery? So I looked back through the, the Earth's history to, to determine when and where it happened. Um, you know, in a way, I wanted to answer, what is it? When we talk about it, the end of the world, the, the, it's apparently happening in December, of this year, and if you want to know what it will be, I wrote it in this book. Um, because I, I wanted to know, how does the world end? I mean, Robert Frost gave us the, the, uh, the conundrum of, it will be fire or it will be ice. But then when you start looking closely, you realize that, that his conundrum was a, was a product of the 19th century, that when they thought it was going to be fire or ice, you know, when it was... It was either, either this extreme or that extreme. But now we've got the planet girdled with, with all kinds of sensors and mass balance buoys looking at ice. And we're measuring the atmospheric chemistry changes. And we're, we're really starting to understand how the world actually ends. And, and I wrote this book to, to answer the question, well, what does happen? When we, when we talk about apocalypse, what is it? And what does it mean? Why do we look for apocalypse, and why does apocalypse matter to us? I'm sorry that the title um, just repeats that word infinitely. I, Apocalyptic Planet is the name of the book. The original name was The Unbroken World, and the book has not changed, just the title. 
because I realized through writing the book that apocalypse is part of things. Catastrophe is part of the world as we know it. And, and, um, and some of us can't wait for it to happen. Um, we are drumming our fingers at the edge of apocalypse going, so when's it going to be real? You know, when's the, the fire and, and people screaming and, and just destruction of civilization? When can we finally rise up and go, yeah! And I don't think people understand that you don't rise up and go, yeah! You're running the other way going, oh my God, it's coming! And so I wanted to write this book to say, you know, those who are waiting for apocalypse... You don't know what you're waiting for. When I was in high school, I had this whole plan. When, when the world came to an end, I was gonna grab my girlfriend, uh, jack my dad's truck and all of his guns, and, and uh, drive off into the desert, into the canyons outside of Phoenix, uh, east of Phoenix, up in that high country, and I was gonna live happily ever after while everybody else on the planet died. That was, that was my plan. Um, now I have kids, and I've got a life, and I, I realize, whoa, that's, this is kind of complicated, this end of the world stuff. I don't, I don't think I would sit too well with it if my civilization collapsed right now. Because this is a wonderful time to be alive, to be on this planet, to be one of the members of civilization, to be one of the members of this planet. I mean, think about it. 10,000 years we've been in the Holocene, in, a, in the garden time on Earth, when, when we don't have too much ice, it's not too hot, it's not too cold, there's plenty of moisture to go around. This is the time to be here. But you look closely at the Holocene, and you realize that, that um, this represents only 10% of the environments that have existed on Earth for the last 5 million years. This moment, this, this moment of rivers, blue skies, green trees, of... Of, of just a perfect time to be human on Earth is a rare time on Earth. And I, I took this book and went out to look for other places, places on the, on the globe that would tell us the story of what does the Earth look like when it goes to its other extremes. I, I, um, I went to, to Greenland as, as part of this book. I was airdropped on the, uh, the ice sheet about two 200 miles out, and um, I was there with a, a chaos researcher named Jose Rial. I love chaos researchers. <laughs> People who, well, his, his uh, task in particular is to look at, at abrupt climate change on Earth and to, uh, to see how it happens and, and what are the driving forces. And, and uh, as we were flying out, we had been waiting for a, a gap between storms to fly out to a camp. It was a, a, a very small camp, um, a couple hundred miles out onto the ice that has seven researchers at a time, and it had been closed all winter, so Jose and I were sent out uh, to open it up, and, and um, as we were flying out, we were both buckled into jump seats against the rear bulkhead. Out of his rumpled coat, Jose pulled two small plastic airbane, airplane bottles of rum for the flight, he said in a gravid accent. He was uh, born in Spain and raised in Venezuela, and I will not try to imitate his accent. He handed one bottle to me. We cracked them open and clicked plastic necks together to toast our journey across the abyss, across the ice sheet. Jose shot back a quarter of the bottle and ducked his head into the oval window to see the ceaseless white expanse roll out beneath us. The ice sheet in all of its glory, he said. He twirled his hand in the air, adding, as Darwin would say, so much beauty for so little purpose. <laughs> so Jose and I, um, you know, I didn't know what I was getting into. I've been, thought, I've been thinking about... Uh, going onto a polar ice sheet for some time. I had never been on this much ice before. I've been on glaciers and, and uh, ice fields, but never a polar ice cap. And we, we landed the, the twin otter there on, on skis next to, next to the camp. And it seemed I'd waited all my life for this moment, stepping onto 5,000 vertical feet of ice. 684,000 cubic miles of contiguous frozen water. I had practically rehearsed this climb down the ladder, one small step for man and so forth. The right prop was still running, ready for departure. The pilots had other pickups and drops to make in this gap between storms. See, this was the season. This was uh, May of 2010 
when all the stations are starting to open up, all the little remote stations around the ice sheet. So all researchers are heading out, trying to get a landing out there. Um, the pilots had other pickups. They wanted us to hurry. I turned backwards and climbed down, searching for the next step. With big, clumsy moon boots, I missed my mark and pitched over backward, leaving the plane much faster than I had planned. I landed hard, hitting the snow like a sack of flour. That is how I arrived on the Greenland ice cap, on my back, sprawled like a bug. Jose appeared through the door and waved at me to get out of his way. I pushed up to my knees and plates of snow broke apart, skittering away in the wind. The sun hung bright and low and I blocked it with one large mitt. The surface was not solid ice, as you might expect, but snow. I tromped around to get my bearings, but there weren't any bearings to get. Sleek, low-profile snowdrifts folded over each other, nearly sanded flat by the constant sugar-sprayed wind. I hooked the door to a strut so the wind would stop, stop banging it closed. Let's get this plane unloaded, Jose said. The pilots moved fast, sliding boxes down to us, and we waddled them off, stacking them out past the plane's wing. It was a five-minute unload, about a thousand pounds of gear. The pilots patted our shoulders, gave us a thumbs up, and thumbs up and climbed back into the cockpit. The left propeller kicked up a loud drone as I backed away. The plane pushed ahead and skimmed over the wind. It rose into a dry turquoise sky and then it banked south, the sound of its props replaced by wind. That is such a marvelous feeling when a plane drops you off in just complete desolation and then leaves. <laughs> I just love that because, you know, it. It's similar to the feeling of a river trip where you, where you push off from shore and your boat enters the water. You know that instant where you're no longer attached to the car, the shuttle, the people who were calling you, the business you had to do. Suddenly you're, you belong to the river and you flow. Same thing. You now belong to an ice sheet. <laughs> the pilots, um, let's see, Jose marched toward the two red work tents as I gave the place a slow 360, any sense of distance was impossible to gauge. Cold and dense, the wind was racing down from higher ice in the east. I turned to see Jose stumbling up the high fin of a snowdrift draped around the side of the kitchen tent. Shouting over the wind, he said, what the hell happened here? Now that I had a better look, I could see an open mouth in the lee of the tent where the door had sprung open during months of winter abandonment. Snow had poured in nearly up to the top of the door jam. The platform was twisted. Built into the ice, it had shifted around and camp had come apart. Oh, this is bad. This is very bad, Jose moaned. As I looked around camp, more damage was obvious. Metal towers had snapped, half protruding from the sculpted surface. These were not from shifting ice. Storms had broken them. Pieces of plywood stuck out at odd angles. Solar panels were 20 feet from where they started, now face down and barely exposed. Snowmobiles should have been parked on a wooden platform held up by metal posts anchored 30 feet into the ice. The snowmobiles were gone, along with the platform and the metal posts. A third of camp is gone, Jose shouted, pacing around, pawing his hood to angle it against the wind. Where are the snowmobiles? I shouted back at him, wondering, too, there was a radio, right? <laughs> Jose waved his glove at the ice sheet. I don't know, they're somewhere down there. I looked under my feet. Down where? There was 5,000 feet of down there beneath me. Jose climbed the snow cornice into the door, cleared a hole, and slid down inside, boots last to go. I climbed up behind him and cupped my eyes. Jose was post hold knee-deep inside of a space, partially buried. Everything had been left in order. Rice cooker under a mound of snow, wine glasses hanging like, like white bells from a rack. Jose said, uh, this is going to take some work. Is the platform stable? I asked. The supports looked bent from the outside. Jose jumped up and down, thudding the snow-capped floor. The structure did not collapse. Oh, it feels sound enough, he said. Let me reiterate, Jose is a chaos researcher. <laughs> chaos. Speaking of chaos. So I went out there to, to uh, get an idea of what is going on on the ice. 
and, and I wrote this book partially to say, you know, what is the future of this planet? Um, what, what's the chance of an ice age coming back? What, do, what are ice ages made of? Um, what, what is it? While I was writing this book, um, a friend of mine in, in Paonia kept coming up to me and saying, hey, so you're talking to all these climate researchers and you're studying civilization falling and all that, so uh, how long do we have? <laughs> and he, he asked me this repeatedly and, I, and my answer was different every single time. Because there is no how long do we have. There is no suddenly the, the, the flash of light is going to happen and the end of the world comes. It's much more complex than that. And you go to a place like Greenland to see how complex it is. You go there and, and see this is, this is the tent as we arrived. Um, um, somewhere in there are the tents that we have to build for, for sleeping. But... And, and as I said, this is Jose going up and Boots last to go in, into the tent where, where the snow has been drifting in and covering things. And everything is frozen. The temperature is a, pretty much a constant 20 below zero there. And, and uh, ice crystals everywhere. This is, this is exactly what I wanted for writing a, a, a chapter about ice ages in Greenland to get to a camp that's, that's completely fallen apart where you look around, you step out of that and um, <laughs> you can keep looking around, yes. It doesn't really change. You always watch this horizon thinking, oh, something's going to come over the horizon. Nothing ever does. And this, this landscape is in motion. The, the camp is moving at three inches a day um, because the ice is, is constantly moving, constantly heading toward the sea where this ice right here, these are 400-foot icebergs that are coming off of the glacier, the excessively loud glacier. Um, this, this, is the, uh, this is about 150 miles ice flow from the camp. So if you left camp there long enough, it would drift down and drop into the sea right here. And we hear um, news every year of major icebergs coming off of both Antarctica and Greenland. And we, we send up this cry, oh, global warming, the, the icebergs are coming loose. What you learn after a while of studying this is that not everything is global warming. Some things definitely are, some things are not. Glaciers are always coming off. They're always calving into the sea because ice is always moving. I, in fact, interviewed uh, climate change skeptics for this book who were saying, oh, yeah, the ice is expanding. This, this idea that it's shrinking is just a scientific hoax because if you look at these different glaciers, they, they're moving down. But, you know, glaciers keep moving. It doesn't matter how much ice is there. They keep sliding down. And what they miss entirely is the deflation of the glacier and then the annual retreat. But yes, glaciers are constantly moving. In, in fact, this whole landscape is in motion all the time. The wind blowing across the surface, making these elegant uh, calligraphy movements where, where everything is sculpted. You drop gear out at the edge of the plane, the plane takes off, and within minutes, these comet trails and shark fins are formed behind the gear because the wind is just blowing all the time. You get gusts there that last for six days that are 80 miles per hour. And they leave behind these elegant shapes of, of teardrops and starships. Everything is sculpted out there. When I, when I got into the work tent to, to start to clear it, this is, this is what I found. This, this, uh, the light coming through the red tent, it, it felt like some kind of vampire ice inferno. And this, underneath this ice pile is the desk of one of the leading authors for the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. <laughs> so there you go. There's, there's a little climate change for you, Conrad Steffen, who usually sits here. I, I, I worked on his desk for probably three hours. This kind of snow is not the soft snow that you shovel off a sidewalk here. It's... It's like avalanche snow. It is just solid. You break it off into, the, into these bricks. You carry it out the door and dump it under the, out the other side. And as I was excavating his desk, I was, I was piecing back together, um, partly for this book, 
the mind of, a, of the, one of the leading climate change researchers in the world, Fla finding his, his burned out candles, his, his pencils worn down to, to nubs where you know he had just sat there all night long working on the numbers, on the equations, figuring out the first what happened to this planet. And I found this back, <laughs> back in deeper, which explains a few things, either about climate change science or about what, what you have to do to deal with what's happening in the world right now. This is Jose. Go ahead and take a swig. Mr. Chaos. So this is this is that that world that we were in that um that that I I wanted to to well for this book I wanted to go into every every landscape that represented an end that represented a, a, some kind of dramatic change to the world as we know it and and I I looked through uh, I I just spun the go the globe on this looking for how things change and Jose my the chaos researcher was the one I was looking for he was he was the one who you know I've talked to so many scientists some saying oh it's going over the edge we're we're past the point of no return the the earth is dead basically at this point and other scientists saying well you know there are a lot of variables going on here. We can't really calculate the future of this planet. So I want to read something to you from out there on the ice sheet. After, um, after a number of the other um, crew for the camp had showed up, I turned, from, I turned back from the edge of camp and stomped my way over to the door of the kitchen tent I cracked it open and a wall of steam came in with me, cold air hitting warm stove air with a second round of hot coffee brewing in two mocha pots. I stomped off as greetings came my direction, men sitting at papers, laptops, Connie scribbling in pencil in his battered yellow notebook. This was what he meant by coffee. Grant proposals worked on, scientific journal articles on climate change, given a thorough peer review. I pulled off my mitts, wool liner, liners damp from sweat or snow melt or both. I peeled off layers and hung them, pulled out a folding chair and dropped into it. Jose looked at me from over the rim of his glasses. You were out there meditating on the ice, he said. Do you think an ice age could start up anytime soon, I asked. This is, this is how I run my interviews. Um, I prefer not to interview somebody in their office, but in a tent in Greenland. <laughs> Connie laughed at the question, amused, but he didn't look up. Nobody seriously talks about a coming ice age in this time of global warming, at least not serious peer-reviewed scientists. Among even fringe scientists, the no notion of a coming glacial period has all but been abandoned like avocado, avocado green refrigerators, a retro idea from the 1970s. It used to be popular back during pulses of global ice growth. In the 1980s, Connie witnessed, Connie is uh, Conrad Steffen, who's that head author for the IPCC I was talking about. Connie witnessed glacial advan glaciers advancing in Norway, pushing through forests, splintering and knocking down trees. That hasn't happened since, and the game has changed anyway, pretty much nothing but ice retreat around the world. Data sets are better understood now, fine grain of observation made exponentially finer. Computer models are in general agreement that nothing but warmer and more erratic climates are in our future. It was the erratic part that interested me. How erratic? Could we somehow swing into a new ice age? I sat facing Jose, who was saying, by its very nature, change is highly unpredictable, and nature by itself changes rapidly. It is, very, it is a very unstable system. What we study doesn't always help us predict very much, but it helps us understand what is possible. I pressed, is it possible for us to enter a new ice age? Jose held in a smile saying, sure, anything's possible. He reached into a bag of trail mix on the table, thumbed peanuts into his mouth as he eyed me, the chaos man. How fast does rapid global change happen, I asked. One or two decades is what I would call abrupt climate change, Jose said. The earth by itself 
chaos just keeps following me around. What's up with that? Stay. The Earth by Itself. <laughs> Thank you. There's so many words in these books. The Earth by Itself makes these jumps, even without us. Right now, we are tinkering on the point where we could initiate a jump on our own. But we don't know where that jump would lead, I said. Connie, over his notebook, said, Yeah, exactly. Jose, a jump could substantially go higher or lower. Both possibilities exist. There are some computer models that say gl global warning, warming can lead to another ice age by disrupting climates. Nico, the French um, uh, postdoc who was there, was looking up from his laptop and he said, but are these models using Mac or PC? <laughs> that made Jose laugh, pra practically snorting with delight. That was how much Jose trusted computer models to give reliable predictions. He had already told me that the only model he really trusted was the actual Earth itself, to which Connie had said, even the Earth is flawed and unstable. But in their defense, Jose said he's a fan of models, knowing that they at least point toward possibilities, not just probabilities. They are the best guesses we have. Connie waved off my question, saying, if we've done anything, we've stopped the next glacial period from happening by warming the Earth. Well, Jose would not outright discount the possibility of a new glacial period in our time. Climate systems are too convoluted to tell exactly what they will do. It, is a nearby ice age conceivable? Of course. Probable? No, not really. But Jose had to give a nod to uncertainty as a dominant factor. He said, science is not about common sense. It is about uncommon sense. It is about seeing what is not obvious. In the middle of the conversation, Nico blurted, you know what, in a hundred years, we're fucked, I guarantee you. <laughs> oh, a hundred years, asked Connie in his sage accent. What do we know in a hundred years? I'm just saying, Nico said. So these are conversations between climate researchers out on the Greenland ice sheet. And, uh, and I'm getting a little ahead of myself because when Jose and I first landed there at the camp, nobody else had showed up. So we were, uh, a storm started blowing in. We were hoping uh, Connie would arrive because this was his camp. He built it back in the early 90s and he would know how to deal with all this uh, um, falling apartness that we had found. And, and uh, they did manage to get in in a gap between oncoming storms. And uh, Connie, Conrad Steffen, this is his 30th season on Arctic ice. He's overwintered in a tent twice. If anybody understands ice, this man does. And, and uh, it, was, it was just an amazing pleasure to spend uh, a couple weeks with him inside of a tent just asking questions or going out into the field uh, working on stations asking what he thinks about the future. And the thing that impressed me most about him is that he could light a cigarette in 70 mile an hour winds. <laughs> I mean, he, he, when he got out of the plane, Instantly, his, his beard turned to ice, and, and uh, Jose was marching him around going, oh, look at what we found and what we've dug. Oh, we're just so screwed. And, and Connie ducked into his shoulder and then came out with a lit cigarette somehow, just sucking it hard to get it lit and going in the wind. And he looked at the camp and he said, ah, I've seen verse. He's a Swiss guy. But he, the, the thing was, he had seen worse at that point. But worse was yet to come for, for Connie because uh, we were there, you know, we had to dig all the snowmobiles out of 15 foot deep pits where they'd fallen. And we got everything going and, and heading back out to, to work on all these, these remote research stations. And, and we discovered soon, this was the 2010 field season, that, and we were heading into spring. It was, it was May, actually heading towards summer. And every remote station that was out there was destroyed. Uh, some were crushed by ice, some had fallen into widening crevasses, and some had toppled uh, during a, um, a tremendous ice melt the previous spring. So all the stations were down. But this wasn't the worst of it. What was going on here was um, the melt is creeping in across Greenland 
you know, it had been 20 below for a long time, but then every day it was going up by half a degree Fahrenheit. So it was getting warmer and warmer until you could sit on the, the south side of the tent until you could actually get out, that's not me, until you could get out and, and take a shower if the wind stopped blowing. Now, we were there for the moment where the seasons changed. And for this book, I was looking for changes of any sort, from personal changes, you know, when your, your world ends every day, when your children go to sleep, when, you know, you know, the world is always ending. The seasons are always ending. Right now, that brush stroke of snow that's come across the San Juans, I mean, this is my favorite day of the year right now when that line forms across the mountains and the snow is coming down deeper and you know, oh, autumn's over. The world has ended. Now it is winter time. I was on the other end here where, where the icicles were going from frozen to water. I was there at the moment of the change, and that's what I'm looking for in this book. I'm looking for the change, however it happens, whatever the scale. A few months later, the melt moved in across the ice sheet. This is the camp up here. This is an aerial picture. The camp was built in the early 90s in the, uh, in the accumulation region of Greenland where, where the ice doesn't melt in the summer. But here, the melt has just gone on and passed the camp. And this is when Coney said, I've seen verse, he hadn't seen this. The camp <laughs> fell apart in July. So having been there since the 90s, the melt has finally passed it and taken it down. The earth is changing. I'm going out into the world to see these changes. For this book, I walked the most desolate, severe landscapes I could find, the, the places that are exposed. You see, this word of apocalypse, I know you have to type it over and over again, but when you type it, remember it doesn't just mean the end of the world. Up in the front of this book, there's a paragraph that says, the word apocalypse from the Greek, apocalypsis, originally referred to the lifting of a veil or revelation. The common definition of it as a destructive worldwide event is more recent. In this book, it is both. So I'm going back to the original definition of apocalypse, to where you peel back the layers and you see what the Earth is made of. This is Sonora, Mexico, on the west side of the Pinacate volcano, out toward the uh, Sea of Cortez. And I was there looking at desertification and, and how I was there in, in the heart of a, or seven years into a drought that has had a few interruptions, but is pretty much still ongoing. I also went up to, uh, to an island off the coast of, of Siberia, Yupik Eskimo Island, to look at their last standing remnant of the Bering Land Bridge, where the rest of the land bridge has gone underwater. And I wanted to stand here and say, so you don't think sea level rise is real? This place, you would have stood here 15,000 years ago and it was 500 miles to the nearest coastline. And now it is the last little island sticking up in the middle of the, of the Bering Sea where the Yupik culture lives there now, uh, walrus hunters and, and whale hunters living in this, this fairly extreme environment, a tundra island on a, you know, just a treeless expanse out in the middle of this, this sea. I looked for any place that took me to the story, that, that took me beyond the world that we know here of the, the, the happy green trees and the smiling sun and the blue sky. I wanted to say, what else is out there? What other possibilities? What, what endings? How does this planet really end when we talk about the end of the world? And, you know, I've, I, I chose nine different landscapes what is the place that I dreaded most? The future that I, when I looked down the path of the earth and I said, oh, this is the worst one that could happen to, to this planet. Iowa. <laughs> <laughs> this was the worst thing I have ever done in my life. <laughs> Two summers ago, I backpacked across GMO fields in central Iowa. I put on a pack and walked through it, and, and this is it. This is days and days of nothing but this. So 
So you're in shoulder width rows. You're kind of squeezed in in between the corn, and you're just moving. You can't. If you want to turn directions, it is a struggle because you've got a full pack on. You can barely even turn inside of these these rows. I'm fucking tired of being hot and sticky and dirty. This is the guy who came with me. Can you say fucking in this book? He is. <laughs> He was sorry. I don't know why he came. Um, you know, I, had, I, had, I was going to go alone, and I said, uh, this is my friend Angus, and, and we'd never done any backcountry trips be, before. And he said, hey, I want to see what it's like to go out and travel around the world. I said, well, I'm, I'm doing this trip in Iowa. Um, and, and we were there during this, this uh, meteorological anomaly called a heat dome when 900 new high records were set across the country. And the temperature, the nearest high temperature to us, um, this is us, it, it was, uh, I think, 129 degrees Fahrenheit on the dew point. I didn't know the planet got that hot. And, and you're inside the corn, high July, it's eight feet tall, and you're seeing nothing but this. And, you know, you're finding each other every once in a while. Hi, we're in the corn together. But this is your world. You're, you're in this, like, lime green light that's filtering down to this shoe polish ground. It, it is really like shoe polish. It's, it's mostly anhydrous ammonia and, uh, and some other petroleum products mixed in with the soil. This is the richest soil in North America, Grundy County, Iowa, some of the richest soil in the world. And, and my purpose in being here was to write about mass extinctions. I looked around the globe for what kind of landscape will tell us what a mass extinction looks like, because that was the purpose, purpose of this book, was to look at different landscapes and say, okay, if X happens, this is what the world would look like. If a mass extinction happens, it will look like corn. Nothing but corn, where the, the, the tall grass prairie that used to exist there has been removed and replaced by a monoculture. And, and I, I found records from the uh, late 1800s where the original pioneers uh, putting in rows and irrigation ditches said it sounded like fireworks peeling back the, the ground because they were popping all the roots of the tall grasses. That is all gone. And so um, I also was looking at uh, genetic modification. Um, I talked to uh, some geneticists afterwards. Um, every day we would drop down to the, ro the rows because it was, it was just too hot to move. So you just lie there gasping. And I talked to these geneticists and they s and about the danger of, of picking up corn genomes uh, or genomes that have, you know, this, this place is entirely modified. And this guy said, oh, you know what? As long as you weren't like naked and rolling around in it, you're okay. <laughs> and, and I'm thinking, oh God, we were like these grimy amphibians out there where we were just covered by it. And then he said, you know, as long as, as you're not um, eating it raw from the source, you're probably not gonna get any genetic transfer. So I think I'm fucked, really. I'm not sure what I am now. You are facing an alien. I have been through the corn, and just let me touch your face, and I will deliver the genes into you. It's kind of a creepy place. I mean, you, you th I thought, oh, this is going to be like a sensory deprivation chamber, just rows and rows. But it's a sensory magnification chamber, because it's just this sound of corn leaves washing over you, and, and you, it's, it's horrible. Don't do it. And Angus, Angus hated me. Like, an, after an hour in there of me, you know, writing down everything he said and taking pictures of me, he could have just throttled me. And, and you're either in this world at the floor, which is creepy, you know? It's not, it's not okay. The corn's growing up these little roots that are going everywhere. Like, it's going to stand up and walk around. And, you know, I have to admit, going into this trip, I was, I was worried about children of the corn. Um, you know, I thought, oh great, we're going to be murdered by children in the cornfield. It's going to be just horrible. 
And, and, I, and I thought I should take a talisman with me, I should prepare myself like the nightmares you're gonna have in the corn. It was so damn hot, I didn't give a shit about children of the corn. Like they could have come at me with scythes and knives and I would have gone, oh cool, something different. Because you're just, you're just traveling through nothing but this. I mean, if it's not down on the bottom, it's up on top. It's just you pushing through and it parting around you. Every other species that existed here has been removed and replaced by this one thing that dominates the whole landscape. 90% of Iowa is under agricultural production. 90% of a landscape erased and replaced by something else. This is the future that I fear, that humans will just keep on going and going and going until we have consumed the entire planet. That is, to me, what terror is. And just moving through it, it's bad enough. This was, that was uh, taken within the first 15 minutes of being in there. Soon we realized you had to dress appropriately. You, you, most importantly, if you're backpacking through corn, <laughs> which I don't recommend, take your bandana and stick it up under your sunglasses. Because that is the spot where the corn leaves just hit you over and over again, and you start to bleed down the bridge of your nose. And I think bleeding in a genetically modified cornfield is a bad idea because everything there has to be bad for you. I mean, where we set our camp is in a place where herbicides had kind of balded the ground. So there was a clear spot. And this is, this is an agricultural drainage where, where it's, it's a really, if, you, if you've grown up in the Southwest, this makes no sense. They have no irrigation there. The soil already has water in it. They have to put pipes under the ground to keep the water moving out of the cornfields and into these drainages and to, to flow away. There is just water everywhere there. You feel like you climbed out of a hot tub. You know, you're just, you're just draining. My journal is all spattered with these sweat marks because you're just, you're just dripping on yourself out there. It is a, it is a water landscape. So we set a camp here in this, uh, in this open drainage, and this is where the grasshoppers live, which is another world. <laughs> because the corn has a gene inside of it that has been placed in there that is a pesticide that grasshoppers can't eat. So they live wherever there isn't any corn. And, and you can hear them trying to get into the corn. You can hear the, the scratching sounds as their mandibles are working the edges of the corn, trying to tear it open. And, uh, and they're just thousands and thousands of grasshoppers. And, um, and they ate my shirt. Because I, I was, you know, I was being Mr. Desert Traveler and saying to my friend Angus, who kind of knows the Midwest, I said, oh, us desert people wear, we wear silk shirts when we travel in the heat because it, it keeps us comfortable. And I realized, God, silk shirts are awful in the Midwest. It's, it's just like a wet tongue stuck to you all the time. And then, and then you get into these drainages and then grasshoppers like the silk. So there are grasshoppers just crawling all over you, eating your shirt, and you're just going, I don't care. <laughs> And then it rained. And I thought, oh great, rain, but then it was hot rain. And 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 you just wait in the corn to hear, you know, maybe Angus will come by and stop and say hi to me, even though he hates me at this point. Ugh. Oh there he is. All right. He Say hi. <laughs> Angus just wanted out of there. I mean, it was three days of, of just walking through corn. And after the first hour, he said, you know what? I think we've learned everything we possibly can about this landscape. And, but we, we didn't. When we came out of the corn, we actually ran into this, this wild little place that I hadn't known about that was right on the edge of the cornfield where, where um, there was a, a crick. They call them cricks there. They're not actually, well, they're water, but they're... There's nothing alive in the water. It's it's really creepy. Like you you pick up a rock here and it's squirming with all kinds of little caddisflies and whatnot. You pick up a rock there and it's just bald on the un underside because this water is not water. It's something else. And we but we walked into this place where there were trees 
and where there were there were millipedes and and mushrooms and and living things and it was such a shock to come out of the corn in the rain and see something like this and what we found was it was an abandoned arboretum it was an old tree museum where the signs had been were being covered over by lichens and and this is what I'm looking for in this book. I'm looking for signs of hope. I'm looking for the place that tells a story that says, okay, beyond destruction, there is something else. I looked at, at cornfields that had been uh, replanted to start up native growth. I looked at places that showed signs of hope, signs of something else alive besides this monoculture, besides this dead stream moving through the forest, carrying fertilizer down to the... Uh, the Gulf Coast, where it creates a dead zone that's hundreds of miles long, nothing lives in it. That's what comes out of the corn. I, I interviewed uh, various farmers, and the farmer who owned the land where we went, um, actually it was his wife who really struck me. One night we were in the kitchen, and, and she said, she had been in the business for 40 years of growing corn, and she said, you know, I don't think what we're doing is good for the earth. And it was really striking to hear from a Midwest corn wife, you know, just, just, and she's obviously somebody who's really thought about this and just said, you know what, this, I know that this is, this is our living, this is necessary for keeping 7 billion people alive on this planet, but this is not good for us. <laughs> Nothing witty for you. <laughs> no, stop recording it. I guess I'm sitting here taking it. Right? Angus just hated me for doing this to him. But this is what I was looking for in order to write this book. I looked for whatever the extremes were, wherever the far places were, the, the edges of our world. I went to the Atacama Desert in South America to, to see, you know, what's at the farthest edge? What's the I wanted to go to the, the, the place that, that represented it, an earth just absolutely peeled back, atmosphere dwindled, oceans boiled away, life just destroyed. And, and this was the perfect place. It was, I mean, two of us, my friend JT and I, uh, went backpacking across this, and, and it was, uh, some parts of it were like walking through coral reefs, and it's all, it's all salt that's, that's just grown up from the ground, hard salt. Salt that, that, that cuts through your boot soles and rips things apart where you, for hours and hours you can't find a place to sit down. And walking out in this landscape, the, it's the driest non-polar desert in the world, you walk for seven or eight days and you don't see a blade of grass. You don't see a fly. You don't see an ant. It is a place where some parts of the Atacama, it hasn't rained for centuries. Think about that. Think about that kind of desert. We did uh, find water out there. It was water that drained off of these 19,000 foot volcanoes where snow had gathered. The water goes under the, the salar, the salt flat, and comes up through it. And I guess I was out there just to say, okay, the earth is destroyed, nothing's left. We've gone to the far edge of things. And, and still, there's life out there. Even though the, the Mars landers, the original landers, were dropped into the Atacama to see if they could find life, and they all came up negative. So, I mean, if, a, if another race from a far-off planet sent a probe here and it happened to land in this part of South America, it would just send the signal back going, nope, just another dead planet. But it's not. When you core down into these salts, you come up with microbes that are suspended in halite, a suspended in salt solution, and they can live definitely at least 40,000 years, a single microbe suspended in the salt, but some researchers believe they can live for 250 million years. So I'm looking at this place going, okay, this is the refuge of life, 
If it burns down to nothing, microbes can still live in this. Do you really want that world? I mean, I'm enjoying the Holocene right now. I think this is an amazing time to be here, but I wanted to take it all the way to the end and see what is out there. And what we found out there were pink flamingos. <laughs> and I hadn't, I, I knew that they lived in that area, that there were flyways through there, but I had not expected it. That they, they come and they eat brine shrimp out of these water sources. And you're up at about 8,000 feet. At night, the water in, the back, in your backpack freezes. In the morning, you get up and you walk, and the, the ice is sloshing in your pack. The sun is rising, and the mirages are just amazing in these salars. These silver mirages start to spread around you, and the light is just blinding, and then pink flamingos start flying <laughs> it overhead. And it's just, you, this is what I was after, this moment of just going, oh my God, this is too much. This planet is too rich to withstand, and all you have is desert, some water, and some pink flamingos. That's all that's left. And that, you know, that's how I feel about this planet. It is just, it is constantly overwhelming me. So how do you get a world like that? How do you get this, this dead planet that, you know, it's, you look everywhere, and there's nothing but this. Nothing but this, this just burned out landscape. How does it happen? What are the options? Well, I take this book out to the extreme. I look, you know, I've, I've looked at anthropogenic impacts and, and various, you know, CO2 in the atmosphere, changing of, of balances, but what really happens here that just blows it out of perspective, that changes the whole planet? I'm looking at asteroid impacts. This is a, a piece that I picked up from uh, the Discovery Channel a few years ago when I was working with uh, Nova and Discovery, and they, this, this I felt was the most accurate representation of a, of a huge destructive event on Earth. I interviewed a, um, uh, one of the leading asteroid theorists from University of Colorado, and he said he's been doing the numbers on this, and he, he, he realized that when an asteroid impact happens, this, he's looking particularly at the uh, Chicheloup impact in the Yucatan 65 million years ago that supposedly killed the dinosaurs. He's saying when something of that size, which was 10 miles across, hits the earth, it just ejects material back into space, which comes raining down over the whole planet. So one asteroid equals thousands of asteroids. And according to his theory, the atmosphere turns to 1,200 degrees Fahrenheit for four hours across the entire planet, pole to pole. So anything on the surface is just charred. And his hypothesis is that um, dinosaurs woke up in the morning happy, and by the end of that day, they were extinct. <laughs> that, that it was just complete annihilation. Asteroids coming back down from this original impact all over the place. As they pass through the atmosphere, they're reigniting and heating the air. So nothing at all lives on the surface. And so I went out to see this world. I went out to replicate a, a resurfaced planet, a destroyed place. And I, I walked across the uh, east rift zone of the big island of Hawaii, which is the most active uh, volcanic region there right now. And I, I wanted to see just a clean slate. What does it look like when it's happened, when it's over, when this, this area where I'm walking right here was, uh, was rainforest about two weeks before I got there. And so I had spent a, a few weeks looking at the, the place, watching flows come over and, and take out subdivisions and, and uh, old forests. I just wanted to see what it was like at that transition zone from abundant life to solid, hard, hot rock. You're walking across it and it is still hot. There are places where these, these tumulas have lifted up and broken open and the air is just, just shimmering over them from all the heat rising out of this place. You're walking across complete desolation. This is the end of the world. This is where the story ends. We set a camp out there and, uh, and we looked for the glow. And this was uh, with my friend JT, who was a photographer. He was there with me in, uh, in the Atacama. And we, we left our camp, which I have to say, leaving your camp in a lava flow, um, we didn't find it until the next sunrise. Because you know when we turned around to look back for it, we went, whoa, it all looks the same. It goes on forever. 
but we looked for the glow and we walked out toward it and and um i'd never seen molten lava before and i wanted to see what it was like you know what what is the what is it like when it's pouring out <coughs> moving at a few inches per second this was not like water it was luminous honey that hardened as it touched air liquid suns spilled and spread covering ground that looked as if it had been created only the night before this solid ground we stood on was riddled with finger width fissures and inside of each was a deep solar glow so beneath us the cracks on the on the ground where the lava hadn't flowed yet they were glowing because they had flowed the night before and hardened. I shifted from foot to foot, taking in the full circle of this dark, glow-crackled plain being overcome by slow, shin-high bellies of lava. The profusion of creativity struck me, so easily replaced as yesterday's intricate forms were swallowed by today's. Here in the rock was the shape of a crocodile, the first banyan tree, a shoulder, a hip. In the next moments, they were buried as bright rivers quickened, then bunched together in dark knots. You could walk right along the front of flowing lava, backing up as you went. Glutinous surfaces slurred with a metallic hiss, and they smelled of a blacksmith shop, only without the oil. I reached out my papaya stick, its tip already blackened, and I poked it in. With the resistance of skin, the lava gave way, and I opened a small hole into a brilliant interior, almost too hot and bright to look into. I wanted to see what this planet is really made of, what happens underneath the surface. This is what's under us right now. You can feel it under your feet, under this building. If this was a glass bottom boat, you'd see molten teeth and gears grinding against each other. And if you put a pinprick in it, this is what would come out. We live on this thin veneer on the surface. And when I was up there, I had a, a penny in my pocket, in my shirt pocket. And I thought, oh, I'll, I'll throw it into the lava flow. This will be my offering to Pele that'll let me free out of this, which turned out not to be true, but that's another story. I fished the penny out of my pocket. It was almost too hot to touch. And I thought, okay, I'm going to throw this in, and this will be part of the book. This will be the cool part where you take all of civilization, everything represented by this 1977 penny, and throw it in, and it will be absorbed. Remember that scene in Lord of the Rings where Gollum fell into the lava and the ring melted? That's what I wanted to see, is the penny just melt back and the earth just take us back in. So I took the penny, and I threw it, and it went, ping, bounced right off the surface. And at that moment, I realized, oh, this is molten steel. This isn't just water, just some liquid thing coming out of the earth. This is molten metal. This is where we live. I wrote this book to show us what is possible, to show the endings that are likely. This book has nine chapters, nine different endings that go from the smaller ones, from, from ice melting at, at, uh, in Patagonia to... Uh, to civilization falling. I looked all over the world to pick the right spot for falling civilization, and I finally picked Phoenix, Arizona. It was perfect. And then I just head out farther and farther to, to major changes, tectonic shifts, volcanism, asteroid impacts, things that just take us back down to zero because these things happen on this earth. We seem to have this belief that the world we're in now will just keep on going, that we will have these green trees and blue skies forever. But this is a small slice of reality on this planet. This planet shifts to different equilibriums very easily. We can push it and it will fall over the edge. There are other worlds out there that this planet exhibits that are not so favorable to our kind. That's why I went out there to say, you know what? Things are probably going to be fine. The earth is going to regenerate. Everything will be good. In 10 million years, you come back and biodiversity will be back to normal. Who's going to wait 10 million years? We're changing this earth right now. And this book is full of these changes where I'm looking at our impact. I'm looking at how we can speed up the catastrophe, how we can slow it down. What is our role in this world? But also, what is the role of this earth? I look at resilience. When we crossed the lava flow, we went to the other side of it. 
we went to where the lava was five years old and somebody already had chairs out on it. And, and you know, pioneer species were moving back in, like this retired guy from the Midwest. He's totally into it. He loves living at the edge of desolation. So do all these little ferns that are coming up. After a couple years, their rhizomes start breaking apart the, the glass and the iron of the lava, and they start making soil. Spiders come in from nearby forests, or little kapukas, little islands that, have, that, have been, that the lava has gone around that repopulate. And, and you go farther and farther, and you're on 50-year-old lava, and, and the ohia trees start to spring out of the blackness, and then it starts to get thicker and thicker until you're in a native tree fern forest on 200-year-old lava, where life has just returned. It has just flowed back in. You should check this place out. Um, I can't say where it is exactly, but, but we were the, apparently the first people to get, first non-scientists to get permits to enter this, uh, this, this native tree fern, rain, tree fern rainforest. And uh, there are no trails in here. It's just all these giant ferns. And, and it, it's a landscape that you could, you could turn it upside down and it looks the same. It's just, it's just green everywhere all around you. All outside, all non-natives have been kept out. Before you go in, you have to scrape your boots with a, a metal brush and you have to make sure everything is washed so you're not carrying seeds in. Uh, pigs and feral cats are trapped and killed around the edges so they can't get into it because they would change this, this habitat. So this represents an older Hawaii, and I've never seen a jungle like this. Um, the, uh, the native mammals to Hawaii before humans, there were only two of them, a bat and a seal. The largest herbivore in Hawaii was a duck. So this is primarily a plant kingdom, a really different world. There are no little trails going anywhere. You're just, you're just climbing through these, these windows in, in the vegetation you're, everything is alive all around you. Tiny seeds, spores, and eggs were glued to the backs of leaves or dangled by silk under long, stiff fern struts. Our faces brushed through dainty webs of small spiders. JT made a bed of dead fronds, leveling a space for his little yellow tent. I threw under, down under a knurl of tree roots that looked like a mossy troll house crammed between fat, shaggy roots. Before dropping my rain bivy and the rest of my gear into place, I peered into windows and pitch dark places inside the tree's base. A Medusa's headed canopy rose above. What looked like a single tree was made of at least three distinct species climbing one another for daylight. If I could have answered the refuge botanist properly when she asked why we needed to see this particular forest, I would have told her I was looking for what the world is like after its surface was cleaned as if with a blowtorch, then given unfettered rain to rebirth. I wanted to follow the thread all the way through a destroyed molten earth and out the other side. This rainforest is what cataclysmic extinction looks like when life flows back in. This was my analog for the world has been destroyed by asteroids and then it has evolved again. Life has come back. What was different in this reborn world? Mammals didn't survive. The world was resurfaced and reformed and we weren't one of the things to come back. Even insects barely made it. In this plant-dominated world, hardly a vertebrate remains. It is one of the possible futures. Abundance returns. The earth lives on and we are not there to see it. The light was going fast. By three in the afternoon, evening dim had already threaded through the wet jungle floor. By five, JT's tent was a soft yellow ovum. The last thing we could see is molasses shadows pooled around us. I felt as if a cocoon were sealing me in. Darkness climbed every tree and fern from the ground up until outside the forest, night finally fell, blackness doubling on itself. We cooked a meal, our pot boiling on a blue flame of a can stove, the only illumination down here in the black. It was like being at the bottom of the sea. Up high, wind purled the canopy roof. Where we were, the air didn't move. It was as still as a tomb. 
I turned my headlamp on and shone it up, illuminating detritus of seeds and spores slowly falling. We're in a snow globe, said JT, looking up through the white-tongued bromeliads and impenetrable tiers of higher canopies. We were seeing what cataclysm wrought. The force of the living is more cunning than any devastation, ready to explode onto whatever it touches. Under fat limbs and umbrellas of tree ferns, life was spilling down, planting its own future. That was the earth I was looking for. Not just the earth that destroys, but the earth that repopulates. I was looking for hope in this book. Not just hope that someday, way down the line, 10, millions, uh, 10 million years from now, life would return and species would be rich again. I was looking for the hope now. I was looking for cornfields that had been replanted as native, native grasses. I was looking for these kapukas, these, these genetic reserves within the lava, anything that showed signs of the earth regenerating. This is not just a story about destruction. This is a, a story about the earth we live on, how it works, the dangers we face, how we play in a role in it, and, and where we are here. We live on a planet that is not stable, that is changing all the time. Ice going out and coming back, atmosphere moving. We are one of the asteroids that hits the planet. We are one of the changes that is happening right now. There have been five mass extinctions in Earth's history since 3.5 billion years ago. We appear to be in the sixth extinction right now which means we are at a moment to pay attention to. We are here at a moment when everything is tipping, where the smallest actions make a difference. We are living in the apocalypse right now. It's easy to look out there and say, but no, the brush stroke of the snow has landed, the seasons go on. It's a much bigger world than that. There are changes happening around us. It is time to recognize the nature of the planet we live on which is why I wrote this book, Apocalyptic Planet. So thank you for coming and listening tonight.